Welcome to the online uh, workshop. It's entitled Research and Ethical Conduct in Conflict-Affected Settings. Uh, I am Dr. Zahi Abdesater. I manage the research programs at the Global Health Institute at the American University of Beirut. Uh, the Global Health Institute is actually organizing and hosting this uh, event. Uh, and I will be happy to moderate uh, the workshop over the next two days. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, the workshop will be recorded just for better dissemination. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A tab uh, that exists in Zoom. Um, uh, also, you can uh, also just one thing that has changed on the agenda. So in the first session, instead of uh, Ms. Javina, we're going to have Ms. Linda Fakhreddin with uh, Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta. Uh, so, uh, please, you can tag us on uh, social media, but more impor importantly, do follow us on social media. I'm going to copy the links for uh, GHI here. Um, and uh, from here, Dr. Abusetta, who is the director, Dr. Ghassan Abusetta, who is the director of the Conflict Medicine Program uh, at the Global Health Institute. Uh, he will be delving deeper into why we're doing this, but just very briefly, uh, the workshop really aims to develop the knowledge and skills needed to integrate uh, the ethical principles when conducting research and conflict. And there will be three main themes throughout these two days. Uh, the first theme will be about the ecology of conflict areas and austere environments. Uh, and the second day, we're going to have two themes. The first one is going to be about research ethical approval. And the third one will be about the ethical challenges in conflict. Uh, with this, I will leave it to Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta. And just a brief introduction about him. Uh, Dr. Abu Sitta is the director of the Conflict Medicine Program at uh, the Global Health Institute at AUB. He is also a consultant, plastic, aesthetic, and reconstructive surgeon, and an honorary senior, senior lecturer at Imperial College, as well as King's College in London. Uh, Dr. Abusetta, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Zahi, and thank you very much, everybody, for taking the time to attend this uh, uh, meeting. Um, really, this uh, 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 seminar or workshop was has uh, 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 been driven by the need to generate more uh, evidence uh, on which we can base our interventions in these complex settings of conflict particularly in our region where conflict has become uh, chronic uh, and protracted and entrenched and the mechanisms by which it has, uh, uh, it reshapes and injures human health has become multifaceted and very uh, uh, interconnected. And therefore uh, providers of services, whether they are health or social services in terms of education, uh, in terms of general well-being of these uh, vulnerable groups uh, most affected by these protracted conflicts are faced with uh, a lack of real uh, 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 usable data and actionable data with, uh, on which to base their interventions and a lack of uh, tools with which they can measure the efficacy of any of these interventions. And so the aim of this uh, uh, course really is to explore with you how these ethical considerations, and they are all extremely valid, uh, can, uh, uh, um, can be first understood and then overcome uh, as part of the design and the conduct of this research. Uh, uh, our first talk uh, uh, which I will be conducting with uh, 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 Ms. Fakhreddin, uh, which is a, um, uh, uh, from the charity Inara, with, with whom I had done uh, some research, really aims to explore what kind of research exists in uh, um, uh, conflict settings and what are the uh, uh, challenges that might face you. So what uh, we will do is I will, um, I will uh, uh, um, uh, uh, discuss 
the, the broad outlines of the different types of possible research that NGOs can engage in. And then uh, uh, Ms. Fakhreddin would be talking about the experience of Inara in engaging with different types of research. So Zahi, I need to screen, uh, share my screen. So it's really a very short uh, 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 slide that I want to share with you. Um, so there are two types of, of research that NGOs can, can, uh, can uh, conduct. One is analyzing existing data. All of the organizations that provide care have, uh, as part of their work, a database or several databases containing actually untold uh, 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 useful scientific information that could be analyzed, that they routinely collect during the delivery of their service. To give you an example, one of the uh, research that we conducted we looked at the weight of uh, weight and height uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, Inara patients that had come through the American University in Beirut to assess uh, um, the degree and the incidence of stunted growth amongst that age group, which means that this is data that was there. It was correct, collected routinely. It was actually correct, collected as part of the delivery of the service that the AUB and Inara were delivering to the patients when they were having their reconstructive surgery. But it was critical to understand the chronic effects of uh, undernutrition and malnutrition on the growth of these children. Uh, um, then there is uh, uh, um, data that NGOs collect uh, for internal use. And so uh, uh, when you are doing a needs assessment or you're mapping out needs when you're planning to start a new service or continue a needs service or part of the requirements of funders uh, for reporting uh, on uh, uh, um, grants or uh, uh, projects that are being funded, NGOs always collect data uh, uh, um, to understand what the needs are uh, as part of their day-to-day -day work. This data itself is extremely useful uh, and would uh, uh, enrich the, the, the literature surrounding the, uh, uh, the way uh, uh, conflict shapes and injures human health uh, um, in a multitude of ways. And unfortunately remains buried in, uh, uh, um, the, uh, in the uh, hard drives of uh, the, the NGOs that provide the, 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 um, provide the service, because there's a, a, a sense that this is not uh, uh, worthwhile scientific information at the time when it is actually the most worthwhile, because it is a, a, a closest to the, uh, um, to the real life experience of these uh, uh, um, uh, patients. And also as part of the requirements of many of the funders and the work of many of the NGOs, you do assessment of uh, efficacy for interventions. So whenever an NGO designs a new intervention, part of their internal processes is to look at efficacy of interventions. And this data is critical to, uh, and is critical to publish so that we share the experiences of different interventions and the efficacy of different interventions so that future in organizations and future uh, uh, stakeholders do not repeat the same mistakes or uh, uh, see the uh, benefit of certain interventions over others. The other type of research that NGOs conduct is new research, i.e. to undertake research uh, 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 not as part of the uh, service delivery process, but uh, in order to either understand or quantify need, uh, uh, to map out the uh, needs of their beneficiaries, 
to help uh, design evidence-based interventions uh, in order to best utilize the limited resources that they have, or to aid with advocacy, to highlight issues that you feel have, uh, uh, are not properly recognized or the size and the urgency of them is not properly recognized. And therefore you need to uh, conduct the research and then use the publication of the research as part of uh, advocacy tools. And in both types of research, the new conducted research and the analysis or researching existing data, they come with ethical implications that I believe these ethical implications are what puts off so many NGOs from uh, uh, conducting research and seeing it to publication or engaging with academic institutions in order to allow them access to their, data, to their databases so that uh, that research can come to fruition. Um, and the aim of this uh, workshop is really to explore with you the uh, uh, challenges, the ethical challenges uh, associated with this uh, endeavor so that you are better equipped uh, to engage in this useful exercise that I think is both beneficial to your organizations, to your beneficiaries, but also beneficial to understanding as a field, as a humanitarian field, the uh, uh, needs and the challenges facing our beneficiaries. So I'll stop there and I will um, uh, leave you to Ms. Fakhreddin uh, to uh, uh, um, talk about um, Inara's experience in uh, providing research. So thank you again for inviting Inara to this workshop. We have uh, to mind our ethical consideration as uh, Dr. Abusetta mentioned. Uh, to uh, provide, uh, we have to take into account that the, the service is not going to be affected if the beneficiary uh, will accept or reject the sharing in the research. So it's a voluntary participation and the, and the service won't be affected. Uh, why do we need to publish and why do we need to, to do research if we... Uh, uh, want to share it, we have to share it our, uh, for it comes purposes. I mean, we have to share it in our social media. Primary, we have to raise awareness. And for our fundraising purposes here, and we want to improve the socioeconomic status. We have to improve the medical status as well as the mental um, health status of the, the families in it. So we always focus on providing holistic care. And because in our case management officers are mainly nurses, so they always advocate for the best interest of the child. And he is the, of, he is the beneficiary here. And research itself done by Inara always reflects our transparency, our uh, accountability and commitment towards this vulnerable population in specific. We always count on research in order, and we focus on the patient's need in order to have evidence-based practice and to direct our uh, service provision towards um, uh, towards uh, more program planning. We have to act on our strategical development. And here we have to base our interventions according to what we have uh, got from the data collected. And uh, that's it all about research. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Fakhreddin. Thank you so much, Dr. Ghassan. Uh, so next, we're going to move to a talk by Dr. Tali Arawi. Uh, the, this will be in two parts, uh, one before the break and one after the break. Uh, the, the talk is titled The Ethics of uh, Research in Regions of Protracted Conflict. I just want to introduce Dr. Arawi. Uh, she is an associate professor of medicine and the founding director of the Salim al Hus Bioethics and Prof Professionalism Program at the American University of Beirut Faculty of Medicine and Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Arawi, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zahi. Uh, thank you everyone for inviting me to be part of this workshop. Um, there are a lot of things to be said, so I'm going to try to squeeze as much as possible. 
And of course, uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, after the talk. So uh, basically part one, uh, let me start with a disclaimer. Although I have taken uh, Gaza as uh, the main area of discussion here, what follows applies actually to most, if not all research done in areas of conflict. So if you look at the pictures, uh, this is from Yemen, for example. Uh, this is Syria. And this is Iraq. So of course, it applies not only to this part of the world, but any area where conflict actually arises. So uh, when we're talking about conflict, we are also talking about disasters. It's a serious dis uh, disruption of the functioning of a community, which involves widespread uh, losses and impacts, be they human, be they material, be they uh, economical, even psychological which exceeds the ability of the community to actually deal with what is happening. Wars are man-made disasters, which makes them uh, double disasters, if you wish. Now, it's very important for us to know, of course, why is research being done? So uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, you're all expert. It is basically to improve knowledge of a particular health intervention and their consequences. It can also be uh, a research in social behavioral sciences. So it also helps uh, to deal with issues related to uh, psychology, to sociology, to anthropology, to the life of the, of the people there. To learn from the ground, and this is a very important point, I'll come to it later, to learn from the ground how to make a difference and to bring to light the predicament of inhabitants caught in conflict. It's very important for us not to use um, inhabitants in areas of conflict as a means to our publications, to our ends, which is basically to publish. It is important for us, or we have a moral obligation to bring to light the pre predicament that they are going through. Now, some researchers, scholars, view areas of conflict as interesting and sensational occasions to work on research and get published. And this is a clear breach of humanism and of ethics because we are treating a human being who is already vulnerable as a means to our own purposes and not as a person worthy of dignity uh, who, who possesses self-worth and respect. It is inhumane and unethical to do research on people. That's why I don't like to use the term research subjects. I prefer the term participant because subject objectifies the person we are working with uh, just to get the grant. And as I said earlier, we cannot use them as a means. Now, generally speaking, because I was asked also to give you a general idea about uh, what research ethics is and how it came about. So let me begin by saying that research without ethics is basically assault. And uh, it is my contention that one size does not fit all. In other words, although we have a lot of international regulations like the Belmont Report, the Helsinki Declaration, the CIOMS, uh, the Nuremberg Code, which I will refer to shortly, it doesn't mean that we apply, uh, apply them blindly every time and everywhere. And we'll come to this later on. So the first question is, who does most research in conflict areas? Clearly, you know that very well. It is basically uh, humanitarian agencies and NGOs like yourselves, and medics and others. And the justification is usually the need to improve the quality of assistance provided in these settings and to collect evidence of the highest standard to inform advocacy and policy change. So there's a purpose that leads to a specific change that will help this or that community. The main aim of course being improving the approaches to the delivery of care, be it biomedical and or social. Local researchers need uh, work on needs assessment. They work on improving clinical pathways and they work on other very important and relevant issues. But as we will see eventually in areas of uh, conflict, oftentimes local researchers are not given the chance to do the research they need to do or they want to do due to a number of restrictions that will be addressed as we move on. Humanitarian organizations definitely uh, are one of the most prominent uh, organizations that does research, be it, uh, for example, MSF, ICRC, or what have you. Uh, 
uh, they need oftentimes to conduct qualitative and quantitative surveys. And actually, if you go to their website, they are, they are the main source of credible information, perhaps. And this is part of their relief operations. However, the, uh, the thing that makes this dangerous is that they are not often trained in the ethical appraisal of research. And uh, this is often not perceived as being part of their core mandate. They are there to offer relief, not to, uh, to be trained on research ethics and to do uh, research in, in the area they're working with. Oftentimes, there is a striking lack of cultural understanding, a lack of infrastructure and human resources, as well as the presence of violence, which can limit both access to populations over time and the ability to conduct research. Now, how did uh, research ethics begin? I will tackle only two things. Uh, first of all, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Nazi uh, trials and the Nazi experiments that took place during World War II. And uh, as a result of the breach in ethics and humanism during these uh, research studies that were under, that actually Nazis or Nazi physicians and researchers uh, did, they were tried in, at Nuremberg and from this trial came about what is known as the Nuremberg Code. Very briefly, uh, it summarizes the idea that it is important for patients, for uh, human participants to give consent, that uh, the study should yield actually fruitful results, that any anticipated result must be just a good justification to perform the experiment. Um, the degree of risk to be taken should never exceed the benefits, so the risk benefit ratio. Most importantly, it should be done by scientifically skilled people. I go back to the idea of humanitarian organizations who need to be trained not only in medicine, if they're going to do any studies, not only on how to write a protocol, but also on the ethics of research. And uh, other points that uh, we, uh, we will give you a copy of the Nuremberg Code, so that will help you look at them later on. Of course, there's the Belmont Report. Uh, this report is often the report that institutional review boards also known as research ethics committee referred to when they decide whether this protocol or this study should go ahead or not. It basically highlights three important principles, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Respect for persons assumes that human beings are autonomous. They cannot be an extension to the will of someone else. They are possessors of inner worth and dignity, and thus we should treat them as such and respect their autonomy, particularly we're talking here if they are capacitated, in other words, if they are capable of understanding what's being done. Beneficence, whatever we do has to benefit the other person. And of course, justice, ensuring what kind of um, participants we need in this trial. And I, I'll come to them anyway in detail. So respect for persons, persons must be treated as autonomous agents. Individuals with diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. Yani, I'm like prisoners, I'm like, um, so basically it's prisoners, uh, pregnant women, children, uh, fetuses, when you're doing uh, research on fetus, and of course, definitely workers and, and uh, medics in, in such areas that are very, very difficult to live in. Informed consent must be obtained because we respect persons who are autonomous, okay? And the research participants ought to be respected and not used as a means. And this is very important. That's why I repeat it every now and then. Vulnerable groups include children, those with limited education, the poor, those with difficult access to health services, pregnant women, the mentally challenged, prisoners, and others. Now, the issue of consent is very important. But it's extremely uh, important for me to highlight that consent is not a form that we give to the research participant to sign. And once we secure the signature, then everything is fine and good. Actually, consent is, an, is a process. It's a process of communication, of mutual understanding, and it begins with information exchange. In other words, it's not uh, a soliloquy. It's not one person telling the other what to expect. It's explaining the study very well, the purpose of the study, the risks of the study, and what have you, allowing the participant to take some time uh, and to ask questions. And indeed, after we explain the purpose of the study, we have a moral obligation to ask the participants to summarize what they understood, to make sure that they have understood what we're doing. 
So it is not a piece of paper, it is not a moment, a moment in time, and it is not a legal contract. So volunteering to participate is a big step and committing to helping to advance medicine, we have to make sure that they know exactly what they're getting into. So uh, again, same idea. So what does informed consent entail? As I, I said it briefly, I'll say it again. Information, everything has to be explained. Comprehension, we have to make sure that the participant comprehends the information and an agreement to participate in the research. Now, this is very important because sometimes agreement is not that simple. There are certain areas where you cannot get the consent of a woman, you have to get the consent of her husband. There are certain areas where you cannot even get the consent of a man, you need to get the consent of the uh, tribal sheikh. So these are issues that we can discuss if you wish later on, but just to say that it is not as simple as it may seem. When you're doing uh, research in refugee camps, and this is something that happened to us, uh, oftentimes you need uh, the approval of the director of the refugee camp. So there are lots of issues that you need to be attuned to. And of course, the interest of the research subject or participant transcends all other interests. Uh, again, informed consent must be obtained. It must be tailored to the level of understanding. Uh, not, that's why often it should be a grade 10 uh, language to begin with. There should be pictures if we are talking to people who might not be able to read. So there's a, a skill in actually working on informed consent. Uh, sufficient opportunity must be given for consideration. And if you are, if you want to take photos, you need the consent of the participant. Unfortunately, many times uh, pictures are taken of people in conflict areas for sensational news and sometimes to fabricate news, which is equally un, uh, unacceptable. Uh, so I have already mentioned this earlier on, so I will not dwell on it. Um, let me take you to the challenges that you might face when working on the informed consent process. First of all, language barriers, particularly if you're doing a, a study in a country that is not your country and that does not speak the same language as you do, as i.e. native language. Uh, from my experience, uh, oftentimes when, when we ask physicians, for example, to communicate a certain message to patients in English, because the training we did was in English, if you want to rate them, you would give them a five over 10. But then I recall one of the physicians said, give us a chance to do that, the same exercise in Arabic, and the result was fantastic. So language plays a very important role. So that's why we speak of language games. <clears throat> culture, what you might think is acceptable might not be acceptable in that culture. And you have to really come prepared, and I'll come to this later on. The level of education, we tend to assume that if we know things or if we take things for granted then other people do, which is not true and which affects uh, the study. And of course, uh, respecting social norms, uh, which is something I learned, for example, when I went to Malaysia, there, there is a, when I was giving a training, there, there's a way we in Lebanon address people or call them to talk. Um, and I remember when we, when we were having this talk, the Minister of Health told me, never use that sign because in, in this culture, it's, it's a curse. So uh, it's very important to be appreciative of social norms. Consent also includes the right to withdraw. So the research participant can tell you, I want to stop. He or she does not have to justify why. <coughs> they have the right not to answer some questions. They have the right to choose to remain anonymous. They have the right to ask you to use their responses only as gender information. And they have a right to uh, read and approve or edit the text attributed to them before it is released. Now, oftentimes this is not done. Main challenges, uh, research ethics committees <clears throat> and national bioethics committees in certain countries are very, very weak or not available or simply pour la forme, as we say. And thus informed consent, most of the time is usually a paper, nothing else. There are linguistic barriers, comprehension issues, which makes us wonder whether this, this is really an informed consent. At times, uh, when you're doing a study that involves DNA randomization, genetic testing, and what have you, it, you cannot assume that the participant understand what it means when you're saying we're extracting from your DNA. Okay. 
They don't understand uh, the idea of genomic medicine, for example. So these things have to really be clearly uh, explained. The cultural and education level, following interrogation guidelines, which might not be applicable, it depends on the literacy average of the region, unfortunately now falling backward in certain areas. Now we always recommend that uh, we give a declaration of conflict of interest, but uh, it was very interesting for me to learn that Actually, it, it doesn't serve the purpose always that you want it to serve because in certain cultures, they say, or they think, wow, he has conflict of interest. So this is a big shot. So this is certainly important and I might as well enroll. So it gives the other uh, intended, intended uh, purpose. And also we always tell the patient, uh, the participant earlier on, you can withdraw whenever you want. It will not affect you. It will not affect the way you are treated. In certain cultures, actually, this is viewed as a hidden threat. So they feel threatened and they, oblige, they feel obliged to, to enroll. And indeed, if you are a physician doing the study, there's the issue of therapeutic misconception. They tend to believe that uh, it, there is a cure in the study. Uh, and there's always an issue if you are the physician giving doing a research with your patient. That's another story. I'm not going to go into this, but it's good to keep in mind. Uh, another thing I realized, for example, in Jordan, uh, participants fear signature. <clears throat> to, in certain cultures, signatures uh, are considered as a legal uh, document, so they're afraid to sign. Uh, oftentimes, the informed consent is too long. We need to find alternative ways. And we need to shift to some form of pedagogical training to check for understanding, which is really very rarely done. Now, all these issues can be mitigated by creating a healthy relationship between researcher and participant <clears throat> based on communication with respect, empathy, respecting autonomy and lifestyle, and giving enough time to the briefing about the scope, nature, finding of the research, and its potential dissemination. The second principle is beneficence, which means uh, when you're doing a study, you have to ensure that you're maximizing possible benefits and minimizing possible potential harms. There ought to be a favorable risk-benefit ratio, and this, there should be a social value and a scientific validity for your study. <clears throat> Publishing uh, routinely collected data can harm the autonomy of a person who has not been informed or given the possibility of consenting to the use of his or her clinical data. So it's not that simple as we, as we think it is. They do carry hidden threats. The benefit to participants is based on the declaration of Helsinki. We will provide you a copy of the declaration, which very briefly says that participants have the right uh, to, um, to be assured that they will have access to the best proven prophylactic diagnostic and therapeutic methods identified by the study, or uh, if it's not a medical intervention, even a psychological, a psychological social intervention, they have a right to benefit from it one way or another. Now, some uh, NGOs uh, and uh, humanitarian organizations choose to do a lot of uh, studies on rape and sexual violence. Gathering information from victims of sexual violence requires a heightened level of sensitivity to a range of issues that probably one does not think of. These can be religious beliefs, cultural, social values, the, in, the legal environment, gender issues, Oftentimes, whoever is going to do a research uh, on uh, rape and sexual violence victims has to be fully trained on how to talk to, uh, to the victim, if you wish, or to, to, the, to the abused, if you wish. Because sometimes you say something innocently, and what you do is simply you awaken uh, pain, uh, you cause flashbacks to appear, you don't want to go there. Third principle is the principle of justice. Uh, put very simply, persons ought to be treated fairly, <coughs> excuse me, fair distribution of benefits and burdens, and which means this has bearings on the selection of subjects. So if you're doing a study, let's say on the effect of war on um, young women, and when you do your study, because you discover that you are living in a, in a, you are doing the research in an area that is too patriarchal and you cannot have access to women, so the sample you use is generally male, that's a breach of the principle of justice. So you have to ensure the selection is done 
equitably and fairly, and that respects the study design. Vulnerability is the key issue when you're doing research in areas of conflict. And I'm, I apologize if you already know this, but this is extremely important and I do have to mention it. Populations exposed to conflict have a heightened vulnerability, which, which actually resulted from mental distress and physical pain and injuries. It also uh, results from the collapse of normal coping mechanisms and deliberate targeting. And this is not a theory. Uh, our generation lived at least five wars in Lebanon. And uh, believe me, this, this still affects us one way or another. Uh, they may be subject to multiple human rights abuses. The potential for exploiting a situation of differential power, <coughs> excuse me, could lead to denying our comp or, or compromising the rights of individuals, which is quite often difficult to control. Most importantly, asking someone to talk about experiences that were frightening, humiliating, or degrading, like crossing a checkpoint uh, in uh, Jerusalem, can increase the level of trauma associated with the event. Efforts should be made to assess individuals in a particular group who are particularly vulnerable as far as possible, exclude them from the research that you're doing. Now, uh, I will wrap up with uh, uh, a video just to make sure that everything is clear and uh, I'm happy to receive any questions if there are any. Let me see if this works. Welcome to this short film about the principles for ethical research and evaluation in international development. These principles have been developed by ACFID, the Australian Council for International Development and the Research for Development Impact Network. Shortly, you will learn about the four principles. Each principle outlines important ethical questions to think about before and while doing research and evaluation in the field. Let's begin. Principle one is respect for human beings. In research terms, this means making sure each and every person involved in the research participates by choice and their rights and cultures are respected. Oops, she's not. She's not. Principle two is beneficence. Beneficence means that everyone involved in the research gets something positive out of it, not just the researcher. The other important side of beneficence is that the research must not do harm or pose significant risk to anyone, including the researcher. Any risks of harm should be identified early and managed appropriately. Principle three is research merit and integrity. Research merit and integrity means that researchers need to be experienced and competent. Also, the research must be well designed, carefully planned, and the process, outcomes, and benefits of the research are clear to all involved. Principle four is justice. In this context, justice refers to making sure that the research is fair and inclusive. It means making sure that no section of a community or population is deliberately left out. This includes children, people with disability, marginalised groups, and people who face language or literacy barriers. Now you've learned a bit about the four principles for ethical research. So basically that's it. Uh, I have to be respectful of time. Um, happy to answer questions if there are any.
Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Talia. There is uh, there is a question um, from Amal Matar. I wonder how possible is it to get anonymous data in conflict zone? Uh, you can answer this one, and then I'll, I'll ask the second question. Okay, so uh, do you mean getting anonymous data or uh, reporting anonymously? So you can really, it's very difficult for you to get anonymous data if you are there and you are the one collecting the information clearly. Because even if you don't know uh, the name of the person you're working with, you already know where he or she is, the gender, the, the physical abuses. But uh, there are other mechanisms when you can send someone to do the study, the collection of the data on your behalf. There are mechanisms when you can do this without being present via, for example, uh, the manager of a refugee camp. But all these include ethical uh, concerns as well. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question is, who does uh, the ethical vetting for uh, research proposals, I, I, I assume, in conflict uh, settings? Okay, so uh, usually when you go to uh, do the research in an area, you come with your protocol already approved from the institution you're working in. Let's say you work in Cleveland Clinic or at AUBMC, and your plan is to do research in, uh, in Yemen. You prepare your protocol, it goes to the Institutional Review Board, which is basically the Research Ethics Committee, and it is studied based on the Helsinki Declaration, the Belmont Report, the Nuremberg Code, etc. You get feedback and you get the approval. Now, the question that arises here is whether it is enough to get an approval from a foreign IRB or should I get an approval from an IRB in an area of conflict? Now, here too, there are other um, complexities that surrounds it. Is there time for uh, an IRB to meet? Are there available IRBs in such dire conflict situations? So again, another can of forms, but I'm happy to talk about this later on if you want. Thank you so much. And just to add, uh, tomorrow there's uh, one of the sessions that's gonna talk about how to set up a, uh, an ethical review board. Uh, and that might be of interest for those who are interested in this. Um, another question, Dr. Taria from Aysam uh, Abdelli. Uh, I think the research of NGOs are mostly needs assessment and also, like you said, for advocacy. But in the same way, it contributes to the development of intervention. Also, donors uh, are enforcing the development. Uh, can you elaborate? So, so let me repeat the question. Yes. Uh, Okay, so I think the research of NGOs are mostly needs assessment and also for advocacy. Uh, but in the same way, it contributes to the development of intervention. Uh, also, donors are enforcing this development, okay. I, I assume, of those interventions. Yeah. So can you elaborate on that? Yes, um, everything that was mentioned is absolutely true, of course. Now, from uh, and that's mainly why we need uh, the research done by NGOs in order to uh, advocate, to play a role in policy changes and what have you. Now, one uh, sensitive issue is related to uh, the donor or who is donating or who is granting the fund for such research. Uh, this is very sensitive, particularly if you're talking about international research and one might argue there might be a hidden agenda that we're not aware of. It's very important uh, that the donor respects the whatever you find, the norms, the values, and accepts that you change uh, your work based on the situation. So the fear is if you are getting uh, a lump sum to do a research, you are indebted to that uh, donor and thus have to um, abide by his or her rules, even when disseminating the findings or when interpreting the data. Absolutely. Uh, one more question from Nancy Tamimi. Uh, how do you define vulnerability? For example, why a less educated person is considered vulnerable? Okay, uh, interesting question, actually. A less educated person is vulnerable only in the sense that you can, someone can abuse his lack of education and make him agree to be part of a research protocol. In that sense, they are vulnerable. Uh, and uh, another word come in, sometimes when they are not educated enough and you use, uh, you want to do, as I said earlier on, genomic studies, which involves also study, not, uh, which involves finding information, not only about that specific person, but about the lineage and the family of that person. 
and they're not capable of understanding exactly what it means when you're talking about genomics and, and uh, genetics, then they are also vulnerable because they don't have enough information. Uh, thank you. So uh, <clears throat> one thing that one question that relates to what you were just saying. So uh, when it comes to intellectual power relationship between the researcher and the, those that are being researched, uh, what how it can affect the results of the research? Okay, uh, I'll come to this in part two, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> but basically, um, particularly in areas of conflict and particularly in areas that are impoverished. And uh, come in, Heide, I'll talk about it uh, next time, and particularly in areas where um, the media has brainwashed a lot of uh, individuals, unfortunately. Uh, to begin with, being uh, coming, let's say, in a lab coat, uh, a foreigner, uh, well-dressed, already implies to the people you're doing your study with who are living in conflict, uh, have no food, already implies that you are a big authority and uh, they want, at times they want to please you, for example, give you the answers that you want to hear. They are afraid of telling you answers that they want to say because they believe, for example, and I'll come to this later on, that you come from a specific particular group and uh, if they say something, you'll probably report them, you'll probably endanger their existence. And this happened a lot actually lately in Iraq and Syria, but we will discuss this next time uh, in the next part. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, research is sometimes politicized. Um, how can we ensure that the ethical component is being implemented? Hello. Implementation is one. Uh, approval is another. So you can get an approval from the Research Ethics Board and uh, this approval says that you can go ahead because everything is fine. You have respected ethics and humanism. On the floor, we really never know, unfortunately. Um, that's why we often request uh, to have audits to see whether what the IRB or REC suggested has been, implement have been implemented. But unfortunately, such things do not happen in areas of conflict. So uh, another part of being a researcher, which we will not discuss uh, due to time again, uh, is the idea of responsible conduct of research. And a responsible conduct of research entails certain traits and characteristics that a researcher ought to possess and to learn. And it's character that actually, character and this uh, RCR that will allow this to be respected and protected. Great. Um, I think there is a component of the question that was not uh, targeted. Uh, so uh, Isam is, is asking about the fact that research is sometimes politicized. Uh, there is political uh, effects on, on the research itself. So given this context of politicization of research, how can we ensure that the ethical component um, is, 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 you know, solid? So I repeat again, the ethical component is supposed to be solid by definition if it was approved by the REC. However, if it's not so solid and, and it's, uh, you, you feel that it is being politicized, again, it's a matter of character. Let me tell you why. I mean, you're touching on a very important uh, concept that is very dear to my heart, which is moral courage. Uh, researchers have to uh, have the moral courage to stand up, to say that this is not how things ought to be reported, nor this is how the research ought to be done. Uh, we are bowing down to politics and uh, we are not being neutral, no matter what comes. So moral courage is not simple. It's, uh, it's very important, but yet very difficult. Uh, case in point is the, um, the scientist, uh, Dr. Nancy Olivieri in, in, in the US long time ago, she, she discovered that a study that she was doing was actually harming kids and she was not allowed to, to say this. Uh, when she dared saying it, she was fired. Uh, but at least now she is honored as someone who possesses uh, ethics and uh, moral courage. So um, you want to go into research, and particularly where people are suffering, I recommend moral courage with all humility. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do have a question. So the, the, uh, the principles that were uh, elaborated in the video that you shared, uh, do you think uh, these the same ones apply to the to the setting of conflict, or should we add some other principles? That's a very good question, and that's part two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, excellent. So I guess we will pick that up in part two.
Dr. Tala now will give her the second part of her talk, The Ethics of Research and Legions of Protracted Conflict. Dr. Tala, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm, I'm sharing screen and I'm going to tell you, I might, not sure, I might exceed way the time, if that is okay, but I'll go. That is, that is totally fine. We are already uh, 10 minutes early, so it's, it's fine. You can take your time. Okay, thank you. So um, this session will tackle the question that Dr. Zahi actually had, whether we have a moral obligation to, ch to challenge universal regulations. And uh, I will address this in, in so many indirect ways, however. So uh, first of all, why would I need to challenge uh, international regulations? Because uh, there are issues that hinder research in areas of armed conflict. There are issues that hinder us following the international regulations blindly in areas of research, in areas of armed conflict. So the first thing that is extremely important for us to keep in mind is that it is very important to get to know the culture, the situation we're going to work in, uh, and the place we're going to go to. Uh, unfortunately, one of the most common mistakes that is often being done by researchers when they go to do research in another area is that they say, I need to read about, uh, let's say, uh, the culture in Iraq. I need to uh, see how they live. They watch videos about it, which is also not enough. Uh, and I'll shed light on this. And uh, they listen to the news, which is also not enough, particularly because as Noam Chomsky once said, uh, the media is a victim of what he called manufactured consent. So all this is not enough. And uh, to explain this experientially, I will share my own experience when I, when I wanted to study the, uh, I wanted to learn how Bedouins live. So I read about Bedouins life, I read about the desert, I read about everything and, and I watched videos and I thought that I knew. Then I decided, take, I don't know how to go to the desert and to spend time with the Bedouins. And I realized that maybe 50% of what I thought I knew was wrong. So it's very important to, to go to the, to the place you are in, you want to study, to live how they live, to eat how they eat, to uh, wake up as they wake up under fire, for example, to, um, to really live their life in order to be able to, uh, to do a, an authentic research with them. Uh, as Chomsky said, he who controls the media controls the mind of the public. The mass media, oftentimes we say, well, let's we listen to the news and we will know how things are happening and the culture we're going to, but Actually, the media are huge co uh, corporations, massive corporations, like uh, linked up with even bigger corporations. So it's an informed, con it's a manufactured consent. It's not a true consent. So uh, this shows two contradictory things: manufactured consent, which is listening to the news, and reflective thinking, which is reading, which should be followed definitely by actual visits. Now, a question that arose earlier on was uh, politics. So let me shed light on that one. States such as Syria and Iran, for instance, require you to state your religion and whether or not you have ever traveled to occupy Palestine on your visa application. If you are Jewish or have ever been to Israel slash Palestine, occupied territories, you are left with the choice of flying or not receiving a visa. In many cases, applying for a research visa to conduct research on a politically sensitive topic means no visa will be forthcoming, while a tourist visa is easily obtained. So you need to really think carefully about these issues and consult with researchers. So here we are starting to, to challenge things as they are. In Syria, for example, political science students are seen as political activists rather than students, and thus um, respondents do not give them the information they want, or they are afraid of giving them the information they want, they need. They fear arrest, torture, or execution for speaking with you. Some information might have to be omitted for their own safety. And uh, at times, you are morally obligated to omit certain information for their own safety, even if you have it. So that's where you will have some moral distress, moral injury. But you have to uh, think through this, use what Aristotle called phronesis or practical wisdom to decide what should be done at this specific case. And what is more important to you, the publication 
the life of these people you are working with and other considerations. You will face political pressure and barriers to research. Uh, the dissemination of sensitive findings might culminate in expulsion of organizations from conflict areas or penalization of individuals or both. Uh, I recall we, we, when I was meeting with a colleague from the ICRC, I asked him once, you have seen so many infringement and breaches of the international and humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions, but uh, you do nothing about it. And that's when I learned something very important. He said, well, we have two options. We either speak up and uh, we say how wrong this is and uh, how it was breached. And we, we will never be allowed to go into that country again. And that, thus we will not be allowed to help people in that country again. Or we have to stay silent, just submit an objective report in order to be able to go there and help them. So that's a decision that you will have to make. Humanitarian organizations, exactly, that's what I said. Uh, they, they might be forced to withdraw from those countries or have been expelled, so it's up to you to decide what is it that you want to do. Now, another important point, oftentimes studies are done based on quantitative, uh, if you, uh, are basically quantitative studies, but I argue that statistical measures alone will fail to capture the full impact of modern warfare on individuals and populations, their health and human rights. I always, with all humility, but this is my humble opinion, I always suggest that even if you have a quantitative study to ensure you have at least one or two open-ended questions, because that's where the treasure really lies. That's where you appreciate the narrative that you are being shared with. You get to see themes you've never thought of, or thought about. So anyway, in the world, qualitative studies are now on the rise. You will not, again, you have your methodology. It was IRB approved. You need to fine tune it or change methodology while there. You discover that it's not what you expected it to be, again, because you, you did your research, listening to the news and reading a few books. But once there, you discover that you need to change your methodology. So what do you do? Usually amendments are sent for IRB approval. You cannot uh, go ahead without any IRB approval. But all of a sudden, you are caught in a country where there is no communication with your IRB. What do you do? You have a fund. You hold, you hold the study, or do you change the methodology? Or better, did you have a plan B before coming to that country in case something happens, that uh, a plan B that was approved by your IRB? Basic data collection system may be absent or poorly implemented. Let's say there's no electricity uh, and, and other technological issues. Insecurity may limit your movement and the ability to collect new data through surveys, which means that your methodology will have to be changed. You will discover the unpredictability of the setting, which may preclude study designs that require a large sample size or a long follow-up period. So um, again, uh, it's not a protocol that I hand in to my RB, I get it approved, I go to uh, areas of conflict and I can apply it. Sometimes there are things that need to be challenged. The displacement of populations also will limit the potential for conducting prospective studies, which require visits. Uh, oftentimes, uh, respondents are lost either to exile or to severe injury or even to death. So you cannot really perform these longitudinal studies. Again, studies that require follow-up information on patients might prove impossible. So uh, that's why it's quite tricky. That's why you cannot just blindly apply regulations and say, well, this is how it is, I'm going to do it. Eventually you are a human being working with other human beings in difficult situations and new things tend to arise. So we really never really know what it means to be on the other side unless we have experienced it. Um, I was uh, writing a paper with a, student of mine on the checkpoints in um, occupied Palestine. But of course, I've never been there. I tried once, I was not allowed to go. But anyone, point being, uh, you all know about these checkpoints, how tough they are, but have you really felt exactly what it means? You have to be there in order to do a study about this. And it's nothing like we imagined. <laughs> I'm 
Actually, some never make it. So, um, come in, this will affect uh, the study, whether you anticipate this or not. Uh, when Ghassan Kanafani, the famous uh, Palestinian author, was teaching in, in camps in, uh, during the war, he asked his uh, students to draw an apple. And then he realized that these students living in camps have never seen probably an apple. They have probably never seen an apple. So he's known to having said, no, no, don't draw an apple, just draw a tent, which means an immediate plan or an immediate decision to, cha to change your methodology or your plan while there, because things are not always the way you would expect them to be. Uh, this is uh, a picture that I found. It's from the, uh, one of the Lebanese wars that we've witnessed. These might seem silly, okay? Um, you have bottles of water, you have candles, you have uh, fire extinguishers and old mattresses. But these meant the world to us because these were, as I wrote, as my sister actually wrote, Wasail Sumud. This is what we used to carry to run from uh, the Israeli invasion. So these are things that, again, the other side never really appreciates. Another major challenge to research done by humanitarian agencies is that the study team is composed of people who are also involved in the delivery of care, as is the case of, uh, with MSF. While this is understandable, it raises ethical concerns, engaging research participants without completing the research sometimes is problematic. There's the therapeutic misconception we talked about. It's a waste of resources, perhaps. And most importantly, if you are a healthcare practitioner and you're doing research and you are uh, in an important point of your research, but you have to go and fulfill your duty as a physician, which one, which call will trump the other? That's, uh, I have my, uh, my own answer, but I'm sure everyone has his or her answer to that. There's also researcher bias. Uh, particularly in SBS, and this is precisely when the researcher comes from abroad with a package of information, of uh, unscientific information that skews or bias, uh, or bias the way he or she interprets what he or she is seeing. And of course, researchers can face life threats. They probably have never thought about this. This will also affect the way they want to apply or do their research. Now, the capacity of ethics review boards in developing countries, and that was a question that was asked earlier on, is highly valuable. Some countries in conflict have no ethics review board at all. So to what extent researchers must seek approval from other ethics boards, and to what extent this is practical or appropriate is not always clear. So uh, there are no sacred cows, as we say. The, uh, again, I go back to the first slide. It's not the case that one size fits all. Now, uh, conflict settings are by def definition dynamic and subject to rapid deterioration. This in and by itself makes research a little bit problematic, very challenging, very worthwhile, but not that easy to, to do. Which, uh, and this has a lot of implications on the implementation of research. And even if you have funding, it's a, it is a big problem. Uh, local researchers often help. But unfortunately, a generation of data is often impeded in certain areas. A typical example, again, is Gaza. Healthcare professionals and patients are disempowered, uh, which is a way of subjugating the information or narrative of the treatment and the disease in a way that is detrimental to the patients, the ability of the healthcare system to, to provide for these patients. Um, you all know, and I think it's coming, uh, the level of um, unemployment, 
is forcing children to work. Uh, children working means they don't go to school. They don't go to school means illiteracy, less uh, scientists to eventually be able to do the research. There are limits to travels in areas of conflict. So there are many things that uh, hamper local researchers and hinder them. Which means, again, the treatment pathway from diagnosis to treatment or, and or palliative care is impeded by conflict. This is an example of um, among many where, empty, where Amman was holding um, a conference, I think, with the Lancet Commission, and the uh, Gaza doctors were not able to, uh, to join, although the conference was on Palestine. So again, uh, when they are hindered to uh, learn more, to share their experiences, it also affects the way researchers can do research and develop their skills. The isolation of the region has meant that the research community has remained too small and underfunded to be able to offer PhD programs. In Yemen, for example, forget about half of the things that we are talking about because the, the basic need now is Maslow's hierarchy of need level one, which is uh, food and drink. And people are dying looking for their biological needs. And of course, brain drain. Now, uh, whether we like it or not, research, particularly if you are a foreign researcher, is unlikely to be viewed by the local actors as neutral or altruistic. You might say this is a conspiracy theory. Maybe yes, maybe no, but it's irrelevant. The idea is that this is how it is viewed and it will be viewed. And another very important issue is uh, oftentimes you open old wounds with no psychiatric care. So the question is, do we have plans? Do we have a plan? in case we open the wounds of, uh, and I'll come to this again later on, of our respondents, do we have a psychiatric backup to treat them? Uh, what do you do when you have side effects, that uh, unexpected side effects that arise from the study you are doing? Oftentimes, you cause PTSD exacerbation, exacerbation of post-traumatic stress disorders. Now, research on children is now on the rise for some reason or another. I hope it is not because it's sensational, but it's important to know that being in conflict makes you vulnerable, being a child makes you doubly vulnerable. You need to have a psychiatric support because you will awaken flashbacks, you will awaken PTSDs. As I said early on, there's increase in child labor and we often criticize child labor without keeping in mind that had, if this child is not working, uh, he will not be able to eat or to feed his sisters, for example, because during the last aggression, he lost his father and father and mother. So we cannot be judgmental. And uh, this is an interesting study on the relationship between war trauma, PTSD, depression, and anxiety among Palestinian children in the Gaza Strip. Now, uh, this is from the last aggression, the 11 days war. Um, so we tend to see, you know, okay, I'm, uh, this is very interesting. I'm going to do study on children, uh, with children, but these children are not the same as the regular children that we see every day because of what they're going through. So I'm going to share this. I'm always sick, I'm always, I don't know. I can't do anything, all of this. What, what do you expect me to do? Fix it? I'm only 10. I can't even do anything in this war. I don't even know what to do. I get scared, but not really that much. I get, I do anything for my people, but I don't know what to do. I'm just ten. I'm just okay, so it's enough. I just wanted to show you the compare a 10 year old in, in Lebanon or in the UK or every, anywhere else to children in armed conflict. It's, it's totally different. Uh, again, I will summarize a little bit and then we'll continue. Number one, considerations for research funding institutions. You're about to fund a research project that takes place in a fragile or conflict-affected context. 
Key questions you can ask include, did the applicants conduct a conflict analysis jointly with their partners? How is the allocation of funding linked to power structures in a research relationship? When evaluating the research design, ensure that the research does not fuel existing tensions in society or politics. As a funder, you can support conflict sensitivity in research. You may advise research institutions in their management decisions regarding resources, priorities, and risk management. Number two, assess the assumptions and political sensitivities of your research design. When you work in a fragile or conflict-affected context as a researcher, be aware of the resource transfer and implicit ethical messages. Your research activities, your research question, can have an impact on your partners, the context, and your research. Ask yourself for whom the research is relevant and who benefits. Make sure you get to know your context and are aware of sensitivities. Number three, partners are crucial. Create and maintain your research network and relationships. What interests do stakeholders have towards research outcomes? Clarify roles and responsibilities with research partners to establish a mutually beneficial partnership. Allow time to build partnerships and other relationships in conflict-affected areas. Mitigate the risk that conflict parties or actors in power could instrumentalize your research, for example, by diversifying your network and transparent communication. Number four, understand your perception and positioning within the context. Discuss with stakeholders how your research topic is perceived. Is it politically, socially, or economically sensitive? Consider that research partners and staff occupy a certain political and social position within the research context. Do you and your partners agree on what to expect? Number five, define an appropriate research methodology. Research methodology can lead both to positive or negative impacts. In what context and with whom can you speak about sensitive issues without fueling tension or reviving trauma? In a fragile context, it is crucial to allow for a flexible schedule and budget for the research activities. If field research is necessary, consider the impact of form and duration of your field trip. Number six, monitoring and reflection during the research activity. Adapt to the risk landscape. Implementing research in a fragile and conflict-affected context requires constant reflection by the researchers and their partners. Develop strategies and mechanisms to identify and mitigate possible risks the context may pose for you. Exchange with other researchers, take care of your well-being. Monitor also possible risks your research may hold for your interlocutors. Number seven, take adequate security measures. A conflict-sensitive approach is also relevant for the security of all the persons involved in your research. Set up adequate personal safety and data security measures for researchers and participants. Ensure sensitive data management and anonymization of sources. Number eight, communicate your research before, during, and after. Communicating research design or data may have an impact on the research context. Who should be informed about your research? Common issues you want to avoid are restricted academic freedom and leaks of sensitive data that could escalate the conflict. Number nine, share and publish research results. The perception of your research not only depends on what, but also how you publish it. Consider different publishing channels and language barriers. Consult with local researchers. Carefully choose the level of detail on which you publish results in order to meet academic standards and prevent disclosure of sensitive data. So uh, this is uh, very important, particularly I want to highlight the idea of funding. Funding is very difficult these days, but it's also extremely important for us to carefully choose uh, who is going to fund our study. It's not any uh, grant agency that can fund our study. We have to really understand what is the agenda of its uh, granting institution? Why do they want to fund the study? just to be transparent and clear. And this is in reply to a question that was asked earlier on again. Uh, so this was supposed to be part three, okay. <clears throat> so uh, vulnerability, as we said, uh, children are extremely vulnerable. And this is a picture that made the news lately. Um, this is one child who said, I used to dream that I was dead. Even today, I'm in continuous fear. Whenever I hear a loud noise or a bang, I feel terror. So we might see them playing. We might see them uh, eating something and we approach them for the study. But we, what we don't know is that all this lurks inside of them. 
and we have to be very, very careful when we do research with them. Uh, there's also the psychosocial dimension of, uh, of disease, of uh, even the psychology. The, there is what uh, my colleague, Dr. Abu Sutta calls the ecology of four that we need to keep in mind. 68% of school children surveyed in areas close to the Israeli border fence were experiencing unusually high rates of anguish because of witnessing death, witnessing home demolition, the, uh, they are anemic, uh, <clears throat> they, <clears throat> excuse me, suffer health problems because the water is not clean, because food is not available, because of uh, yeah, 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 101 things that affects who they are now. Oftentimes it does not show and doing research with them can awaken deep rooted traumas. This is uh, come in another story that made the news and everyone was happy, at least sadly and happy that this girl made it. <laughs> So one might say, at least there's this girl, um, she will <clears throat> keep life going. But then uh, different re reports have revealed that although this girl survived, she does not talk. She does not react. She has a limited uh, uh, communication with others. In one word, she's traumatized. So these are things that we really often tend to miss. Now, of course, there's the issue of big data and I'm not going to go through that, but big data is uh, basically everything we're doing. Even now we are online. So uh, all the information is being collected, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, what have you, everything is collecting every, and every data is being collected. The idea of um, the passport for COVID-19 also is another way of collecting data. And there are issues about privacy, about confidentiality, about justice that lurk in the mind of, uh, of people. A lot of issues regarding data collection, storage, sharing, reuse, replicability, paradigm shifts, and particularly accidental findings are extremely important, but I'm assuming my colleagues at the IRB will be discussing those with you. Finally, uh, let me summarize again. When it comes to methodology, uh, it, has to, it might need to be revisited depending on what one might face. Narrative, focus groups, safety for the holding the latter is not that simple. How to interpret the data from which point of view is extremely important. As far as access of information, remember it's an unstable environment prone to violence, it's a dynamic environment. There will be difficulties at times in, in accessing regions, groups, areas, and participants. There are a lot of ethical controversies. You will eventually discover that the methodology has ethical implications that were not initially considered, the importance of doing no harm, the moral responsibility of researchers doing interventions which might infringe on privacy, confidentiality, security, etc. The need to establish an ethical framework for decision making using practical wisdom, phronesis, the importance of informed consent, of risk assessments, and what have you. And of course, there are other issues like uh, the psychological impact on researchers and respondents. So it is not only the case that you might cause indirect harm by awakening traumas or uh, hidden fears or uh, flashbacks in your respondents, researchers themselves are prone to uh, trauma. They are prone to depression. They are prone to uh, even physical harm in areas of conflict. Trauma and conflict and post-conflict areas is very important to, to keep in mind. Now, we go back to the first session, first few slides. Uh, International regulations are possess, uh, talk about a number of things. There are core values that need to remain everywhere when you're doing research, everywhere at any time. But there is a periphery that, uh, that circles around the core. There's a periphery that makes things a little bit different that you need to be attuned to. 
and this periphery has been discussed uh, throughout today. So you will have to challenge. If you want to be ethical, you will need to challenge some clear cut regulations. Uh, you need to be aware uh, about, uh, I, by the way, this is uh, something that is downloadable, a report that is downloadable. I really recommend that you download it, a conflict sensitive approach to field research. And these are points that are highlighted, the issue of sensitivity, the importance of being flexible, uh, appreciation of the local context, when do you have to do trade-offs, political sensitivity, security, communication of results, and others. There is a code of ethics of conducts for NGOs doing research. This is also downloadable from the net, very interesting to, uh, to look at. So in a nutshell, to summarize what we've done today, I think, let's listen to this. Number one, considerations for research funding institutions. You're about to fund a research project that takes place in a fraud. How is the allocation of funds? Okay, that's the same one. I'm sorry, there was a mistake in downloading manage. So what are the points to remember? Uh, never send naive researchers. Uh, the worst thing you can do to a research and to researchers and to respondents is sending naive researchers. When you want to get a grant, make sure you research the grant very, very well and the granting uh, agency. Make sure that when you're doing your research, or most importantly, when you're reporting, you're not just stealing the narrative of the people to, to get published. It, this is a very loaded term. Do not deceive refugees or uh, people in conflict about coming back when you know you're not going to come back. Do not tell participants you will affect policy changes when you know that you will not. And avoid labeling in photos. Khastan, with the social media now, we see different labels to so different pictures, but these are human beings who will grow eventually. For example, labeling little kids. 10 years time, this little kid is going to be, say, 20, and it's going to affect his or her uh, life. So labeling is not a pleasant thing. So these are things we really need to avoid. My final thought is that um, Oftentimes, we want to be ethical, we want to follow the law, and we want to be humane. But unfortunately, what is ethical is not necessarily legal, and what is legal is not necessarily ethical. And this might sound bizarre coming from an ethicist, but being too ethical uh, verges towards the unethical. And most importantly, sometimes ethics and humanism conflict. And if you choose to follow the ethical uh, principles too blindly, you will eventually end up harming others and breaching humanism. So you need to decide which is it, ethics or law or humanism, not a simple thing. This is uh, just to tell you how unpredictable things are. You're doing a study here in the famous Hayy uh, Shaja'iya in Gaza, and this is how it became in 2014. When you want to return, this is what you see. So it's not as simple as it is. Technological and medical developments are happening at a rapid pace. There's almost no limit to what we can do. That is true. Yet not everything we can do, we should do, unfortunately. Uh, foreign researchers come with their international research ethics baggage that does not apply in conflict zones. And it is not true that research ethics is the same whenever we do research. And there are ethical and scientific challenges of undertaking research and reporting from conflict zones. I thank you and I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Talia, for this uh, inspiring, impactful, and emotional uh, uh, talk. Uh, we will take any, any questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, I just want to add that the Hanan, uh, I think Hanan is from Palestine. Uh, she said um, at some point that UN agencies in particular will not accept the results of uh, the research, um, impose the researcher to adopt neutral language that doesn't bother the Israeli occupier. For example, my friend conducted research on detained children uh, UNICEF refused to publish the results as they came. They removed the most important part of the research under the um, accusation of, of, of biased language. And I think you, you touched on this, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. it, it often happens, that is true. Uh, again, this is where moral courage comes in. 
and uh, we need to understand what, why do they see this as biased? They might be right, so we need to be aware that this is a possibility, but in case it is not, we need to stand up for what we think is right, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, we will it's a recipe for... for making life difficult, but at least it's a good life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, okay, I see no questions. Okay, uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Talia. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, one more talk by Dr. Gayas Hussain. Uh, the talk was supposed to be on ethics in emergency settings. Uh, however, ironically, he had an emergency uh, and he had to fly back to uh, to Sudan. Uh, so, so this talk, we, we will not be able to, to have it today. We will try to have it tomorrow, hopefully, if he was able to join us. Um, I, I think Dr. Talia's uh, talk sets the uh, stage and the tone perfectly for tomorrow's session. Um, uh, tomorrow will be on really the know-how of how uh, to uh, conduct ethical research conflict or more focused on how to um, obtain ethical approval in, in, in this context. Uh, we will talk about uh, the, the IRB uh, at AUB will discuss uh, the governance of research, how to set up an IRB or a research ethics committee, uh, the types of ethical reviews that, uh, that exist, data confidentiality and privacy, as well as how, what are the processes that you should go through to secure ethical approval. Uh, then we will have a session on ethical challenges in research dissemination. Uh, then how to address uh, common ethical dilemmas in, 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 uh, when it comes to research in uh, conflict settings. And uh, by the end of the uh, workshop, we will have uh, any sort of questions and as well as open discussions on representative cases. Uh, so so uh, for that session, the, the discussion part, um, the audience, the attendees can bring with them any sort of uh, case studies that they would like to discuss uh, and uh, our speakers can can answer those those questions. It would be a, a more of a of a lively discussion. So Amal's question: Would you consider collaborating with Israeli academics? Uh, can you run that again, please? So, would you consider collaborating with Israeli academics? What do you mean? What do you consider, Shriani? Would you? Would you? Would you? I know. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Very. So there sorry. is. There is your answer, Amal. Uh, Uh, okay, uh, so I'm going to tag this as answered. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we will pick it up tomorrow at 9 a.m., just like today.